This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Alchemy gets a bad reputation these days. People tend to associate it with witchcraft and mysticism. However, despite the fact that several alchemical pursuits didn't work out, the seeds of modern chemistry were always there. According to the Leiden and Stockholm papyri, which at 1,700 years old are probably the oldest surviving list of chemical recipes, humans have been doing chemistry for a very long time. The papyri describe procedures to create false pearls, to give one gem the appearance of another, and to make certain metals resemble gold. For instance, a recipe for the manufacture of copper similar to gold is as follows. Crush some cumin, pour on it some water, dilute and let it remain in contact during three days. On the fourth day, shake, and if you wish to use it as a coating, mix chrysocolla with it and the gold will appear. Since ancient alchemists knew of these techniques to make one thing resemble another on the outside, the next logical step would be to think, okay, how can we completely transform it all the way through? This would have been the birth of the quest to find a way to convert base metals into gold. Since all chemical processes involved the reaction between one thing and another, a search began to find the substance that could react with a base metal to convert it into gold. This elusive substance became known as the Philosopher's Stone. It was also thought that the Philosopher's Stone could be used to create an elixir of life which could grant immortality to anybody who consumed it. For centuries, alchemists performed countless experiments desperate to be the first to discover it. There were many routes that alchemists followed to find the Philosopher's Stone. Many investigated the properties of metals such as gold itself. Others did experiments with the semi-metal antimony, which appeared shiny and silvery like a metal but was brittle like a non-metal. Some thought that mercury was the answer, the only metal which was liquid at room temperature. Due to the Philosopher's Stone's association with the elixir of life, other alchemists investigated organic substances, such as eggs, hair or blood, to try and find some life essence with which to forge the Philosopher's Stone. In 1669, a German alchemist living in Hamburg called Henich Brandt was investigating a different organic substance, urine. This gold-tinted liquid was thought to have some relation to metallic gold. He collected a huge amount of urine, some accounts say it was around 1,500 gallons, almost 7,000 litres, and left it for around two weeks until it putrefied and maggots started to form. It's unclear why Brandt included this step, but it might be that the growth of maggots indicated the life essence in action. From here, his idea was simple. Evaporate the water from the urine and investigate the residue it left behind. So, he got to work. He slowly heated a huge vat of putrefied urine, its volume reducing and reducing as its consistency became more and more viscous. Finally, after a couple of days of heating, he was left with a thick, oily substance which he transferred to a retort and heated. Eventually, a red oil distilled out. He left the retort to cool and saw that the residue contained a black spongy upper layer and a salty lower layer. After discarding the salts, he combined the black layer with the red oil and put them back in the retort, then heated them intensely for several hours. Brandt watched the retort closely, waiting eagerly to see what would happen. Would this finally be the day that he achieved what so many before him had failed to? Brandt had been attempting similar experiments for years. Back in those days, a bride's family would commonly pay a dowry to the groom to provide them with enough funds to start their new lives together. Brandt had spent every penny of his first wife's dowry on failed experiment after failed experiment. After she passed away, he got married to a wealthy widow whose financial resources allowed him to continue his search for the Philosopher's Stone. After years of unsuccessful attempts and a small fortune wasted, he stood in his laboratory diligently watching the retort as it turned hot. Suddenly, brightly glowing fumes burst out from the oily substance and filled the retort. At the same time, a liquid dripped out of the neck, erupting into flames. 
That exact moment was captured by the English painter Joseph Wright of Derby around a century later. It's a stunning and dramatic painting in which Wright chose to romanticise the scene by using a medieval Gothic background rather than that of a 17th century laboratory, adding a religious significance to the event. The look of awe on Brandt's face perfectly encapsulates the sense of wonder he must have been feeling as this glowing substance emerged from the retort. I can only imagine what was going through Brandt's mind as he watched this magical occurrence happening before his eyes. He was able to catch the liquid in a jar and cover it, where it solidified and continued to give off a pale green glow. Excitedly, he watched it, expecting this cold fire to go out, but the glow kept going hour after hour. Surely, this radiant matter produced from an organic substance and glowing with a life force must be it, the Philosopher's Stone. After centuries of alchemical dead ends and countless of his own futile attempts, he had finally succeeded where so many before him had failed. He gave the substance the name Phosphorus, from the Greek word phos, meaning light, which is the same root as the word photo, and phero, meaning to bear or to carry, which is the same root as the word pheromone. So phosphorus means light bearing. Prans had achieved something amazing, but what he wouldn't have known here was the actual chemistry of what was happening. The black spongy layer was mostly charred organic material, which largely consisted of carbon. Upon intense heating, the phosphates in the urine would have reacted with this carbon, whereby the carbon would take the oxygens from the phosphates to leave behind elemental phosphorus, in a reaction called reduction. The 7,000 litres of urine yielded Brandt just a few hundred grams of phosphorus. Interestingly, if Brandt had kept the salty layer, which is mostly made up of phosphates, his yield would have been significantly higher. As it was, to Brandt, it seemed that only a tiny, very precious amount of phosphorus could be obtained from urine. By the way, I'm getting a lot of this story from John Emsley's The Shocking History of Phosphorus, which I strongly recommend checking out if you want to learn more, so I'd like to thank Emsley for telling such a great story. Also, I'd like to thank Skillshare for sponsoring this video. If you enjoy watching my videos, then I'm going to guess you enjoy learning new things. In which case, Skillshare has got you covered. This partnership has come at the perfect time for me because I've been wanting to upgrade my digital art skills from, um, zero to something reasonably respectable and Skillshare has been enormously helpful with that. Skillshare is the biggest online learning community out there with thousands of classes led by industry experts across film, music, design, productivity and loads more. With so much variety, Skillshare can help you take your career, skills or hobbies to the next level. When you join, Skillshare asks you some simple questions about your interests and then immediately provides you with recommended classes and curated learning paths, all tailored to your goals. Personally, I've been exploring the class on isometric drawing in Affinity Designer, which has been great. I learned so much so quickly and I even used some of my new skills to create images that I've used in this very video. Recently, Skillshare has also announced some exciting improvements, including smarter class categories, new class topics on creative careers, creative inspiration and AI and innovation, and the ability to find specific classes by software and material. Having spent several years in academia, my sense of time is permanently fixed into the academic calendar, so since we're heading into autumn and starting a new academic year, this is definitely the time to kickstart your productivity and learning. The first 500 people to use my link in the description will receive a one month free trial of Skillshare. Get started today. Okay, back to the video. Brandt's next goal was to find out how to use his newly discovered phosphorus to turn base metals into gold. Once he figured it out, he would have more wealth, power and influence than he could possibly conceive of. Over the next six years, Brandt kept the recipe for phosphorus a closely guarded secret while he continued with his experiments. But to his dismay, no matter what he tried, he couldn't manage to produce gold. His finances once again began to dwindle and frustrated, he began showing phosphorus to friends and soon enough, it became the talk of Hamburg. However, no matter how much people begged him, he refused to reveal his method for how it was made. When one German alchemist, Johann Kunkel, heard about this remarkable new substance, 
he immediately paid a visit to Brand to see it for himself. When he saw the amazing glowing solid, he became fascinated by it. He asked Brandt how it was made, but Brandt refused to reveal his secrets and Kunkel left disappointed. After the visit, Kunkel wrote to a fellow alchemist, Johann Daniel Kraft, and told him about what he'd seen. Kraft, without telling Kunkel, immediately travelled from Dresden to Hamburg to see this substance for himself. Like Kunkel, Kraft was fascinated by the sight of it, and he asked Brandt how it was made. When Brandt refused to tell him, Kraft asked if he could buy Brandt's supply of phosphorus. By this point, Brandt had once again run out of money, so he agreed to sign a deal. For 200 thalers, Brandt would give all of his phosphorus to Kraft, and he also agreed to produce more for him as he required. In today's money, 200 thalers is the equivalent of around 7,300 pounds, or $9,700. Considering the potential value of his discovery, it goes to show you how desperate Brandt was financially. Part of the deal was that Brandt must never tell Kunkel how phosphorus was made. So yeah, you heard that right. Kunkel had written to his colleague Kraft to inform him all about phosphorus. Kraft then swept in, bought up all the phosphorus for himself, and made sure that Kunkel would never be told how to make it. Some friend. As Brandt and Kraft were talking, there was a knock at the door. Brandt went to answer it and found Kunkel had come to pay him another visit. Kunkel wanted to find out more about Brandt's phosphorus and offered to buy some. Brandt refused and said that he had none left to spare and that he had failed at making any more. Kunkel was insistent in his questioning and asked him again how he had made it. Brandt, desperate to get rid of his unwanted visitor, finally admitted that it came from urine but would say no more. Disappointed, Kunkel left empty-handed and set off to start doing his own experiments on urine. An excited Kraft then took Brandt's phosphorus and used it to successfully produce a huge amount of gold for himself, although not by using it as a philosopher's stone. Instead, in the spring of 1676, he set off around Europe where, for a fee, he would entertain the royal courts with demonstrations of phosphorus's remarkable properties. He would darken the room and show how it glowed as if by magic, and how it could be easily induced to burst into flames. In September 1677, Kraft travelled to England to entertain the court of King Charles II with the wonders of phosphorus. By now, its properties had become well known, so the English-Irish chemist Robert Boyle invited Kraft to give a demonstration to the Royal Society, which Boyle had helped found 17 years earlier. At the demonstration, Boyle was amazed by what he saw. He asked Kraft if he could have a sample of phosphorus, or if he would tell him how it was made. Kraft refused to do either, but eventually he admitted that the source of phosphorus was somewhat that belonged to the body of man. After Kraft left, Boyle thought about this enigmatic clue and eventually deduced that he could have been referring to urine or possibly to feces. A year later, Boyle hired a man called Bilger to help him in his central London laboratory. Bilger had the lovely job of boiling down large quantities of urine and, yes, feces for Boyle's experiments. However, no matter what Boyle tried, he was unable to make phosphorus. By early 1679, Boyle hired someone else to help, the German alchemist Johann Bescher. If you've watched my videos before and you're wondering why that name is familiar, it's because Bescher was the grandfather of phlogiston theory, which is a great story from the history of chemistry that I have an entire video about. I'll put the link in the description. On Bescher's recommendation, Boyle also hired Ambrose Godfrey Hankwitz, who had worked as Bescher's lab assistant back in Germany. Now, neither Bescher nor Godfrey were able to make phosphorus from urine, but they both knew of someone who could, Brandt. When Godfrey next returned to Germany, he paid Brandt a visit and managed to convince him to give them the missing piece of the puzzle, very high temperatures. On his return to England, he told Boyle what he had learnt, and Boyle got to work on a new batch of urine. He boiled it down to a thick oil, then heated it in a retort until it became red hot. A vapour distilled over and solidified in the receiving flask. Boyle grabbed the flask, took it over to a dark corner and, to his delight, saw that it was glowing. He had successfully synthesized phosphorus. 
Meanwhile, ever since Gunkel had been betrayed by Kraft, he had also been experimenting with urine. And around the same time that Boyle made his discovery, Kunkel made a similar discovery. Hence, both Boyle and Kunkel are credited with their independent rediscoveries of phosphorus. Due to Brandt's secrecy, his role as the actual discoverer of phosphorus would remain hidden for decades to come. Boyle wrote up his procedure for the synthesis of phosphorus in a sealed letter not to be opened without his permission or until his death, and he handed it in to the secretary of the Royal Society, Robert Hooke. This used to be common practice for scientists who had made a tentative new discovery but wanted to do further work to confirm it. If another scientist came along and claimed they had discovered it first, you'd simply need to open the sealed letter to prove that you'd already discovered it. Over the next couple of years, Gottfried continued working on phosphorus on Boyle's behalf and got very good at producing it. By 1682, Boyle's academic interest in phosphorus eventually waned and he turned his attention to other pursuits. Godfrey, seeing the business potential, opened a workshop in central London and began producing large quantities of phosphorus for sale. His reputation for making the best phosphorus allowed his business to rapidly expand. He employed multiple workers and was eventually exporting phosphorus around Europe. By the early 1700s, Godfrey was selling phosphorus at as much as 60 shillings per ounce, which would have been the equivalent of around £1,800 or $2,400 today. Since his annual output of phosphorus was estimated at around 25 kilograms, he would have been earning the equivalent of around £350,000 or $470,000 per year. Its amazing properties convinced many doctors that phosphorus would have dramatic healing effects, and it was sold as a medicine for a variety of conditions even into the 20th century. The main form of phosphorus used, white phosphorus, is highly toxic, so it's baffling that it was used in medicines for so long. Phosphorus would also go on to become a major component in matches, fertilizers, and incendiary weapons. Luckily, today, we no longer need to obtain phosphorus and phosphates from urine. Although Godfrey's human waste method was the only method known for around a century, in time, other, more practical sources were discovered as the phosphorus industry expanded. Following urine, phosphorus manufacturers used bone dust, then guano, which is the accumulated droppings of birds or bats, and finally, phosphate rock. Today, Tens of millions of tons of phosphate rock are mined each year. The industry has certainly come a long way. What I find inspiring about this story is that it's a great example of how failures can be turned into successes. Is there even such a thing as a complete failure if there's something to be gained from it, even if that thing is just knowledge or wisdom? Henrik Brandt spent his whole life trying to produce the Philosopher's Stone. After accidentally discovering phosphorus, he spent six years trying to get it to convert base metals into gold. Although that proved impossible, and although he didn't know it at the time, he became the first person since the ancients to discover an element. I'd count that as a major success. Let me know in the comments below about any other weird discoveries, and if you've made it this far, I'd really appreciate you subscribing. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.